Welcome to History Hack. If you didn't know by now, we are the revolution. That means we're sharp, witty, lots of fun, but it also means that we're essentially the peasants in Les Mis huddled round a table in the corner of the bar with no money. If you enjoy the show, please do support us. We have a Patreon account by which you can donate a small monthly sum in appreciation of what you're hearing. Alternatively, we have Ko-fi, in which you can just do a one-off donation as a thank you if you particularly enjoy a certain episode. Either way, we massively appreciate all of your support. Hope you enjoy the show. Hello and welcome to another episode of History Hack, me again on my own. But I'm not on my own because I have John Croucher with me, who is an emeritus professor at the Macquarie University of Sydney, who has published 130 research papers and 30 books and has four PhDs, which leaves my postgraduate certificate looking very, very lame. But he's here today to talk to us about his new book, IT Girls, Pioneer Women in Computing. So, uh, John, welcome to History Hack. How, how, how are you doing? Oh, thank you, Chris. Nice, it's nice to speak with you. Yeah, yeah, it's um, it's a really interesting subject covering uh, a lot of you know, a large amount of women in groundbreaking fields in in IT. Yeah, it certainly is. Um, uh, it was a it was a bit of a labour of love. It took a long time. This is a this is a follow on from another book I wrote called uh, Pioneer Women in Science, and so this is the, the back covered physics, chemistry, biology, and so on, and medicine. Uh, this specific book, Pioneer Women in Computing. Uh, Look specifically at those women who um, who contributed to the world, I suppose, of computing over 300 years, starting with uh, with Nicole Rain Lepot, born in, born in 1723, to Joe to to the youngest one, who's Joy Willow Wawini, born in 1989. So um, there's a lot of talented women there, and uh, our diversity is recognised through um, inclusion of women from a lot of different countries. Yeah. As you said, because you cover quite a large period of time, how has the role of women changed in the world of IT over that sort of period? Well, IT itself has changed over a long period of time. Uh, but but when we look at uh, tiny women in computing, we're looking at things in mathematics, data analysis, calculation, computer design, software programming, computer language design, and women like Mary Hawes and, and the development of COBOL. Uh, Beatrice Worsley and Transcode, uh, Radia Perlman, developing the, ed- the educational robotic language logo, um, and artificial intelligence applications. Joan Ball, computer dating even is a, is a, is a part of the pioneers in computing, teaching and textbooks across information technology, computer science and related fields, Lynn Conway, Sandra Forsyth, Rosa Peter, uh, astronomers like Janet Taylor, uh, cryptography, crystallography, Eleanor Dodson, Dorothy Hodgkin, and many astronomers, uh, like Mary Blank, who we're going to talk about shortly, and we're going to leave it, uh, Maria Mitchell, Janet Taylor, Anna Winlock, design of, of even computer icons themselves were done by Susan Kerr, and the legal protection of intellectual computer property, uh, Susan Nycombe, and the corporate side of computing and IT sectors, uh, Ruth Amonet and Carl, uh, Carol uh, Bartz, at L. Goldberg, and so on, uh, and, uh, and Megan Smith. So it covers our... Whole lot of areas over a whole lot of time, and we can see how computing and IT has evolved, and, and women have been a very big part of that and a very important part of that. Yeah, absolutely. And you, you've lit, you, the book covers so many, so many uh, groundbreaking women. I've, I've gone through and sort of selected a few. So I'm going to start with, uh, as you mentioned already, Mary Adela Bragg carried out breaking work in astrology, didn't she? Astrological she study. Yeah, she did. Yeah, she did, Chris. She was uh, she was born in, on 17th of May 1858 in Staffordshire in England, um, and she lived till she was 85. She died on the 14th of April 1944, and she was interesting because she trained herself in mathematics by reading her brother's textbooks because she wasn't allowed to to study herself. And she um, what she did was she did a meticulous analysis of of, of variable stars by stars by stars. Of, uh, variable, we mean where their brightness changes, either regularly or irregularly. And she combined all the raw data that was obtained by everybody else that had done this. And amazingly, she analyzed uh, 4,000 4, star observations in the course of one year. And then they gave her the task, she did it so well, of uh, collating labels assigned to them uh, found on existing lunar maps. And she did that for t- two maps in German and one in English. And by the time 1930 came around, 1913 came around, she published a book called Collated List of Lunar Formations, was its, was its name, 
And that's got an index of 4,789 entries. Wow. And uh, she, uh, she proposed new standards of names for various features of the moon. And she did it using telegraph, using the sorry, telescopes and photographs to find their exact locations. And, uh, she established a system to measure a star's brightness. And her findings are, are now a basis for future astronomers. And, uh, by 1920, her reputation was, was so great. She was appointed to the Lunar Commission of the, uh, of the then newly formed International Astronomical Union. And, uh, she was so good that they honored her with a moon crater named after her called, simply called Blag. And that was her. So she was, she was amazing living back in the early days, uh, with astronomy. Wow. That's, that's really quite impressive. It also, because I suppose a lot of people would look at that crater and go, what the hell? Why, why is it called that? That's a really odd name, but that's <laughs> to have an actual person behind it. It's, Makes it's, like that it's amazing. There are crazy, there are a number of craters named after women. She's, uh, you know, and their, and their pioneer work, and she's one of them. I don't know how many craters there are on the moon. I guess lots, and eventually they'll, they'll run out. But she, uh, but she was very important. And, and as we said, Mary, uh, passed away in 1944, but, uh, uh, but they still named a moon crater after her called, uh, simply called Blag. Now there are a few people called Blag, but it's named after Mary. That's her. Mm-hmm. Uh, everyone knows that I've got a, a biosphere for German history and uh, German achievements, so it's no surprise that our next per, our next <laughs> our next name is a German. Uh, how did Greta Hermann became a person of quite some significance in the field of quantum mechanics thirty years after her paper was written? Didn't she? She did, and like some people, their work's not recognised for a long time after they did it, and sadly that applies to women in particular. But Greta was born in uh, on the second of March, nineteen hundred and one, in Bremen, which was then known as the German Empire. And she passed away on the 15th of April, 1984. So she lived entirely in the 20th century, aged 83. Um, she was a very bright girl, as you, as you could imagine. In 1926, she received a PhD, uh, in, uh, in, in a very fancy sounding thesis that, that with, with the title, The Question of Finitely Many Steps in poly, Polynomial Ideal Theory. And that became published in mathematical annals in June of that year and became the foundational paper for computer algebra. Even if she just did that, that would have been something. But in, in 1935, she published another paper, which she called The Natural Philosophical Foundations of Quantum Mechanics. And that was described by a very well-known philosopher called Werner Heisenberg as, quote, yeah. one of the earliest and best philosophical treatments of new quantum mechanics. Um, in the same year, and this is 1935, so she's only a, only a 34-year-old or 33-year-old even, she published a critique of mathematical uh, genius John von Neumann. Now, John von Neumann is known as the father of game theory, and he did a proof in 1932 which claimed to demonstrate uh, a variable theory in quantum mechanics was impossible. And her paper went largely unnoticed, as, as you mentioned, Chris, for over 30 years, and it wasn't until 1966, 34 years later, that um, John Stuart Bell, who was a physicist from, North, from, from Northern Ireland, um, published it again. And her other discoveries were then uncovered, and she became quite well known because of that. She became professor of philosophy and physics at the Teacher Training College at the University of Brenham, Bremen. And today, she's, uh, she's still a person of some significance in the field of uh, quantum mechanics, considered a a genius by all accounts, and even 14 years after her death, in 1998, they translated her 1926 article, The Question of Finitely Many Steps in the Theory of Polynomial Ideals, and it appeared in uh, the Journal of Communications in Computer Algebra. So she was quite amazing, and it was uh, it was some 34 years after she did her initial work that they finally realized just how good she was. Yeah. Wow, yeah, it's... um. It's good that she's got that recognition finally. Absolutely. Sadly, it's not just gender roles that can hold some of these women back. We also have sort of racial problems as well. What happened with Evelyn Boyd Granville? Yeah, it's interesting. Evelyn Boyd Granville was born on the 1st of May 1924 in Washington, D.C. in the U.S. And um, amazingly enough, she only died a few weeks ago, um, 27th of June, 2023, this year. And she was 99. And, um, she came from a very poor background. Her father was William, a uh, uh, William Boyd. And he worked at just odd jobs. He was a janitor, a chauffeur, a messenger. 
and uh, mum stayed home and raised and raised the children. Uh, but when Evelyn was young, her parents actually separated, uh, and uh, she was raised by an African American commu- uh, a family in a community in Washington D.C. But she was exceptional. She was extremely bright, and she uh, she went to Dunbar High School, was an all black high school, and did so well. She was accepted into Smith College. Uh, that's, uh, that's also for really bright people. And uh, as an undergraduate, she majored in mathematics and physics. Now, we're talking here about the 1940s, uh, and uh, she had a very keen interest in astronomy. She graduated summa cum laude, and uh, for those who don't know that, that's the top honours you can get at American universities, summa cum laude. Um, the, the Smith Student Aid Society, because she had no money, awarded her a graduate scholarship and she was accepted into the graduate program in maths at Yale University, and she got her PhD in 1949. And uh, she also had a rather fancy dissertation called On Laguerre Series in Complex Domain. You think, goodness me, what was that all about? Well, she was only the second African-American woman to receive a PhD from an American university. Um, when she finished her PhD, she searched at, at, at New York. Yeah, at New York University Institute for Mathematics. And the following year, she took up a teaching position at Fisk University, which is a college for black students in Tennessee. And in 1956, when NASA, when IBM received a NASA contract, she got a job there as a computer programmer in the Vanguard Computing Center in Washington. She then was employed in the U.S. Space Technology Laboratories later renamed in 1962 as the North American Aviation Spatial Information System Division. And what she did was she got involved in the projects in the Apollo program, the moon the moon landings, involving celestial mechanics, trajectory computation, and digital computing. So from a very poor, humble background, that's what she ended up doing, working in the Apollo program. Um, for all her work, she uh, she got a lot of awards. Uh, she was the first American, she was the first African American woman mathematician to receive an honorary doctorate from an American from an American institution, Smith College. She was awarded the Wilbur Lucas uh, Cross Medal, the highest honor from Yale Graduate School Alumni Association, and she was a staunch supporter of STEM education. And after her retirement, she traveled around the U.S. Uh, telling people about the importance of mathematics and learning. So. That was a, that was a little bit about her point. She was an amazing woman, and like you know, like a lot of people, um, came from very humble beginnings. Yeah, to, to break not just the gender ceiling, but also the uh, a time where race was such a racial segregation was such. Yeah, she yeah, she would have had that that black mark against her, so to speak. Uh, but but she um, but she got through all that, and uh, is now feted. You know, as one of the one of the greats. So. During the course of this podcast, there's going to be a few names that are going to come out that a lot of people won't have heard of, but I'm pretty certain the next name they've more than likely heard of. Hedy Lamarr, not just a movie star, is she? No, well, no, she certainly wasn't. Um, she was born Hedwig Eva Maria Keisler, K-I-E-S-L-E-R. She wasn't Hedy Lamarr, she wasn't born Hedy Lamarr, but, but she was born uh, the 9th, 9th of November 1914 in Vienna in what was then Austria-Hungary. And she lived till age 85. Uh, she died on the 19th of January 2000. Um, she was billed later in life as the most beautiful woman in the world, and uh, that would be evidenced by her six husbands, I guess, later on, if we come to that. But she was the only child. She was an only child of a, of a mother who was a pianist in Budapest and a father, Emil Kiesler, who was a prominent bank director. And it wasn't until the late 1920s when she was still she was still a teenager she was discovered as an actress. I'll talk a bit about her acting career first. And um, she was brought to Berlin by producer Max Reinhardt, and she was trained in theatre. Then she went back to Vienna working as a script girl and then an actress. She was still a teenager in 1933 when she married Friedrich Mandel, who was 13 years older than her, so he was about 32. And he was chairman. Uh, he was the chairman of a leading Austrian armaments firm. In the same year when she was 19, she uh, this is what actually put her on the map, of course. She appeared in a German production called Ecstasy. You can probably Google that on the web somewhere. But uh, it's the story of a young girl married to a man much older, which sort of imitating her real life, but who falls in love with a young soldier. And in the movie, she was seen uh, swimming and running naked. Um, it made world headlines and was banned by the U.S. government. Well, once you ban something, that makes it something everybody wants to see, doesn't it? So, yeah. 
that's what happened. But 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 she was largely self-taught, and in her spare time, she worked on a lot of hobbies and inventions. And among those people she knew, and I guess probably largely because of her looks, um, was Howard Hughes, the type, the aviation type in Howard Hughes. And he actively supported her interests with you know with with finance. And he placed a team of science engineers at her disposal to use in her research. And sometimes during the Second World War, she she heard about a new technology of radio of radio controlled guidance systems for torpedoes using spread spectrum and frequency hopping technology to try and defeat the jam the uh, jamming by enemy powers that could send them off course. And what she did was she came up with the idea of what's called a frequency hopping signal that couldn't be tracked. And so, and so she actually was granted a patent for this on the 11th of August 1942. And that patent was under her, was, uh, was under her birth name, Kaisler. Uh, in the 1960s, the U.S. Navy adopted it. The principle, uh, the, the principle of their work being incorporated into Bluetooth technology. Uh, and they're finding similar to methods used in, uh, in Wi-Fi. And it was this spread spectrum technology. That Hedy Lamar helped to invent that would launch the digital communications era, uh, arguably forming the technical backbone that makes cell phones, fax machines, and other wireless operations possible. So that was her contribution as well as all her acting. Um, she was a very busy girl. She was married and divorced six times, but remained single for the final 35 years of her life, in which she would remain a, a recluse, sadly. So there we are. So that was Hedy and Wi Fi. Who without without Hedy Lamar I wouldn't be talking to you now because I'm connected to my Wi-Fi. <laughs> yeah, and getting a bad signal too, possibly. Uh, yeah, yeah. No, no. Hedy was amazing. She was in a she was in a more uh, contemporary movie with I think it was uh, Victor Mature, uh, mm-hmm. of course, Samson and Delilah, and of course she played the love with Delilah, and that also put her on the map too. But she was just an amazing woman, and she said that the. Um, Looks had got her where she was, but it was also the ruination of her life. Uh, the, the fact that she watched, she did look so good. So if you don't know what Hedy looks like, either buy, either buy the book or look her up on the web. Hedy Lamar. There she goes. Preferably buy, buy the book. Buy the book. Don't look on Google. Preferably buy the book. You get a lovely photo of her in the book. Yes. <laughs> and, and much more about her there as well. And all, all the other women that we're going to cover and more. But we'll, we'll, <laughs> but, about a hundred of them. Yeah. We've still got a few more to go now. Um, but talking about the Second World War, we also have Mavis Beatty. What was her war career like? Mavis Beatty. Uh, Mavis Beatty was born in 1921 in, um, uh, in, 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 in Dulwich, an area of South London in England, of course. Her mother was a seamstress and her father was a postal worker. So once again, not from a very rich background. And uh, Mavis died in, uh, in, on the 12th of November 2013. She was, uh, she was aged 92, but she did something fascinating. In 1940, when she was, uh, would have been about 19, she was recruited to work as a code breaker at, uh, at Bletchley Park, which I'm sure many visitors will have heard of. Uh, and Bletchley Park was a British government cryptological establishment in operation during the Second World War. And she worked as an assistant to the well-known code breaker called Billy Knox, or Billy was his nickname. And so in the same year, in 1940, she started work on the Italian naval Enigma machine, and by March the next year, she effectively broke into their framework. She deciphered a message which she worked out read in, and I quote, today's the day minus three. So she worked out what the Italians were up to. She and her colleagues uh, then worked for three days and nights, discovering that the Italians were intending to assault a Royal Navy convoy transporting supplies from Cairo to Greece. Their deciphered messages uncovered a, the detailed plan of the Italian attack and enabled the Allies to uh, to destroy much of the Italian naval force off the Cape of Matapan uh, near southern Greece. Um, the leader of the attack, Andrew uh, Admiral Andrew Cunningham, later visited Bletchley Park to personally thank Mavis for her role in making the victory possible. But she wasn't finished there because in December 1941, Mavis decoded a message between Belgrade and Berlin that enabled his team to determine the wiring of something called the Abwehr Enigma, a machine previously thought to be unbreakable. She also deciphered another of their machines and doing so enabling the British to, to read its messages as well. They were able to confirm that the Germans believed the double-cross intelligence they were, um, were being fed by double agents. 
uh, who were recruited who were recruited by Britain as spies. And from that point onwards, MI5 knew the Germans believed everything the double agents were telling them, uh, and uh, uh, allowing them to suggest that the Allies had an entire army ready to storm the part de Calais, which wasn't true. While she was still working at Bletchley Park, Mavis met a mathematician and fellow code breaker, Keith Beatty. They were married in 1942, and she spent some time in the diplomatic service. So, you know, she was made. A, she she got a, she got an MBE in 1987 for her work. She's also a keen gardener, for what that's worth as well. Uh, so, in her early 20s, she is responsible for one of the greatest naval victories of the British of the Royal Navy during the war. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. To have such a massive, uh, just in her early 20s, that's amazing. She she was a code breaker. That's what mm. she was. So, moving away from the Second World War, we have Ruth Leach Amonette. What was her IBM career like? Well, she had an amazing career at IBM. Uh, she was born in Oakland, California, on the 24th of September 1916, and she died not that long ago, 21st of June 2004 at 87, uh, age 87. In 1937, she got a Bachelor of Arts degree in Political Science, then worked as a dental assistant, which all seems a far cry from anything to do with computing, but... Uh, in February 1939, she actually got a job as a system service rep for IBM, uh, with, with her role being in, uh, demonstrating IBM typewriters. And little did she know that was going to kick off her career, but in July 1940, she was only age 23, she became an IBM instructor at the U.S. Department of Education in Endicott, New York, and three months later, they gave her the role of Secretary of Education for IBM. Uh, and that role sort of trained female employees about the products and selling them right across the United States. She was so good at it that on the 16th of November 1943, when she was about 27, she became the vice president of IBM, 27, um, thanking Thomas Watson, the 69 year old chairman, for his vision and thought and foresight in employing her to such a high level position. Um, at the age of 27, she was one of the few women in corporate power in the United States, as well as one of the youngest. Um, according to the IBM board of directors, her promotion was, quote, in recognition of her ability and the increasingly important part which women are playing in the operation of the company. In 1945, when she was, uh, would have been 29, she received several awards, outstanding American Woman of the Year, Women's National Press Club, and was selected as one of the 10 Women of the Year by Mademoiselle magazine. Following year, she received, uh, she served on the New York State Women's Council and received an achievement award from the Women's National Press Club. So she wrote, uh, she retired in 1953 and wrote a 200-page autobiography, which, uh, which was called Among Equals, a memoir, the rise of IBM's first woman corporate vice president that was published by the Creative Arts Book Company. She was no, she was notable right across the U.S. for her work in business, an outstanding teacher, following many roles of note. Uh, she was a trustee emeritus at a community hospital, served on the boards of, um, of Monterey Peninsula United Way, the Symphony Association, international studies, including being chairman, member and president of the Carmel by Sea Garden Club, the Garden Club. So she didn't just work for IBM, she did a lot of other things as well, but she had a meteoric rise with IBM one of their stars. And I think for a woman probably back in the 1940s to be, uh, you know, the vice president at age 27 is pretty amazing. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah as soon as I saw that, I was like, this is an amazing achievement. And it's, it's someone I'd never heard of before. So I thought, I've oh, definitely got to put her on yeah. the list. Yeah. I think it's probably true, Chris, that most of these women, most people wouldn't have heard of either. That's partly why I wrote the book, to sort of give them some recognition. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And, um, We've got a few more to go through, and then so it's um it's one of those things that when when you compile questions and you're going through alphabetically, yeah. you, how many people go to look for someone who's got the, the closest name to them as possible? And so with the surname What's of Sam, name? Sam's. So so I went with uh, Jean E. Oh, Sam. Yeah. That's very cheap. <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah. nice work there. Yeah. Yeah. Not a relation, I don't think. Yeah. No. <laughs> yeah. She was the closest I could get to, and I thought, like, yeah, she's definitely going in the yeah. list. Yeah. <laughs> but um, how influential was her work? Oh, pretty influential. Um, uh, uh, Jean was born in, on the 23rd of March, 1928, in New York, in New York City. And uh, she died on the 20th of May, 2017, not long ago, aged 89. Um, her parents were both lawyers, Harry and Ruth. 
and uh, and, uh, and and Jean attended uh, Mount Holyoke College, and in 1948 she got a Bachelor of Arts with a major in mathematics and a minor in political science, which may be a bit of an odd combination to some people. She then went to the University of Illinois, uh, and she got a Master of Arts in 1949, and then embarked on a PhD program at the same university. Um, in 1949, she saw a computer for the first time, and she said she didn't impress her at all. Quote, she called it an obscene piece of hardware. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody made their life out of it. Anyway, it's, it's like not liking somebody when you first see them, but getting to like them later on, I guess. Uh, she didn't complete a PhD there, but in 1951, she took up a job at Metropolitan Life Insurance Company as a trainee actuary, and she uh, she took part in in-house training, learning about punch card accounting machines, and she soon got on top of that. Uh, and by 1953, she got a job as a mathematician for, for a place called Sperry uh, Gyroscope, or Gyroscope in New York. And she was there for five years. Uh, there she solved mathematical problems for clients and operated what then at the time was called an analog computer. Uh, she also worked uh, on the Department of Navy submarine program as, as part of her job. Uh, this is all in, by January 1955. She was still only age 26, and she uh, she started her career, a new career, as a, as a programmer on a digital computer called the Sperry Electronic Digital Automatic Computer, or SPEEDAC. And her first uh, job was to write the basic loader for SPEEDAC, um, a 20-line program that took three days to write by hand in binary code. Um, and before long, she became the group leader um, of a group of programmers who acted as consultants to the engineers and helping other people write their, uh, their programs and routines as well. More programmers were hired and they produced more, more software. And in 1955, uh, Sperry Gyroscope and, uh, uh, combined with Remington Rand, and they became Sperry Rand. And this gave uh, Jean access to the Univac 1 computer. Uh, and she also came across a woman called Grace Hopper, the remarkable Grace Hopper, who is one of the other women in, my, in this book. Anyway, in 1959, Jean and five other programmers established uh, the influential COBOL programming language. And some of the listeners may have heard of COBOL. It was something that I actually learned when I was I was uh, young. Um, the program was written in just two weeks, and the next year the Pentagon in 1960 announced it would not buy computers unless they ran her COBOL, uh, creating industry standards. So in the mid-1960s, she was appointed chairperson of the Special Interest Committee on Symbolic and Algebraic Manipulation and was elected as the Northeast Regional Representative of the Association for Computer Machinery. And uh, she stayed there in 1968. So, as well as doing all that, she wrote uh, an iconic book, Programming Languages, History and Fundamentals, published in 1969, and which she published an overview of 120 different programming languages. And it was still being, in, being used in the US um, uh, many decades later. Uh, the, between 1977 and 1979, she organized and was appointed as the first chairman of the American Federation of Information Processing Society's History of Computing Committee. She was on the board of directors of the Computer Museum for 10 years as well. In 2001, they made her a fellow of the Computer, Computer History Museum and received the pioneer work for, quote, her pioneering work and lifetime achievement as one of the first developers and researchers in programming languages. And in 2013, the National Center for Women and in Information Technology awarded her their pioneer award. So there we are. So she was pretty good. Well, they're all pretty good. She was just yeah. a, she's another example of a pretty a woman that you wouldn't have heard of, sort of an unsung hero, if you like. Absolutely. I'm, I'm, I'm pleased with my choice. <laughs> Based on my made a very good, made a really good choice, Chris. Usually when people, someone once said, uh, what's your surname? I said, oh, Sam's. I went, oh, like Michael Sam's. I went, yeah, and went, you know, the serial killer. Like, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. And he's not relative either. <laughs> uh, we we have a cricketer here called Sam's. Um, he plays he plays in the um, uh, in one of our one day tournaments. I think he plays from New South Wales. I'm sure he's not related either to you. So not, not with my ball throwing skills. <laughs> no, he's a bowl, he actually he's a bowler. He's a fast bowler. There you go. <laughs> so this is off topic, and it probably get edited out. But uh, when I was at school, uh, we were doing cricket. And we were all lined up, and we just had to throw the ball down down the field towards where someone was batting. 
and uh, my PE teacher was bald. And he got hit on the bald spot by, by a tennis ball. And he oh. turned around and he said, which one of you is responsible? Someone threw this. Everyone stays quiet. And in the end, I put my hand up and he went, all right, back to bowling. I went, really? He said, I've seen you throw Sam's. I know that wasn't on purpose. <laughs> Wise man. <laughs> a few months later, we were doing javelin and I stepped up and he went, oh, no, I'm moving far away from you as possible. <laughs> um, another is. He still, still had his wisdom. Yeah. <laughs> he's, he's, he's probably in the Schwicker slip now, is he? <laughs> <laughs> that would explain a few things. We're moving on. Uh, <laughs> That's right. yes. we, we've only covered a, a small selection of, of the 100 or so women in your book. You must, ha- you must have some favourites as well. Is, are there any that you, you think that we should speak about and get, get that sort of stuff while we're here? Look, I do have a favourite, and that favourite's name, her name is Janet Taylor. And I confess that she is actually related to me. Uh, she was my great, 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 great aunt, and she was born in 1804 in Walsingham, up in County Durham, and she passed away in 1870 at age 65. And uh, she had just had a remarkable story. In fact, it was so remarkable that I wrote a whole book on her called um, uh, called Mistress of Science, the, the, the story of the remarkable Janet Taylor. And that was published in about 2016. But she was interesting. Her, her father was a reverend, and uh, she was one of six children. Her mum died when she was uh, quite young. She, her mum died giving birth to the sixth child when uh, when Janet was only six years old. Her name was actually Jane Ann. Uh, when she was nine, a scholarship became available for girls uh, 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 who were aged 14 and over uh, to attend the Royal School for Embroidering Females, of all things which had been established at Amptill in Bedfordshire under the patronage of Queen Charlotte. And even though she was only nine, um, they gave her the scholarship. And so she left County Durham uh, and went all the way down to Amptill uh, and uh, was in the school, and uh, she was there, strangely enough, until she was age 14, And um, in which case the Queen, the queen Charlotte died and uh, the new queen closed down the school. So she, so she went off, she taught herself French, became a housekeeper, Went and worked with her brother, but she was in fact a child genius. She went to a, she went, she attended her father's school when he, he was a schoolmaster up in, up in, um, up in Walsingham and she used to sit in the class with all the boys. So she was very comfortable around men, if you like, or, or, or males at the time, which served her well later in life because when she was, um, in the, in the 1920s, she was solving very difficult nautical problems. And so she started to write a book. But one of the problems uh, back for women in those days was that you weren't taken seriously unless you were married. They didn't really care too much for single women. So she had to find a husband. And uh, unfortunately, the rules of the day were that if she got married, her husband uh, owned all her property. Well, she wasn't having a bar of that because she inherited some stuff from her father, the Reverend Peter Iron. And so she finally found a bloke who agreed that he wouldn't take the property, and that was um, his name was George Taylor Jane. And so she said, "Okay, we're getting married." So, so Jane and I married George Taylor Jane. So she would have ended up being Jane Jane. Well, she wasn't having a bar of that either. So she changed the name, her first and second name, and she became Janet Taylor. So she wrote her books in 1929, her first book. And she wrote a lot of books, but in September 1834, she, she, she was an inventor. She invented something called the Mariner's Calculator, uh, improvements in instruments for measuring angles and distances for nautical and other purposes. It was an early type of computer, ingenious, it was an ingenious thing. And between 1617 and 1852, there were only 79 patents awarded in the category of compasses and nautical instruments, all awarded to men. But during that 235 years, she was the only woman to get a patent accepted. Um, later on in life, uh, there was an encyclopedic work of 2,200 uh, important people and mathematical practitioners of Hanoverian England, and she was the only woman of those 2,200 that was included in the book. Um, she was a compass adjuster, chart seller, inventor, and author. Um, she she was a compass. She ran a compass adjusting firm with 100 100 men in it working for her swinging the compasses on the Thames, and today the biggest company in England having has 10. So she was amazing, and uh, she died in obscurity, unfortunately. And so I thought I wasn't having a bar of that, so I went over to England, found a grave, did the grave up, wrote a book about her. Now she's got one of those blue plaques. 
So that's a little story. Yeah, so it's a fantastic story and definitely so definitely one that we should should not be forgotten. And, I, and yeah. the fact that you've got the you, you've taken that champion as well is it's just amazing. Yes, yes, yeah, and you know it, she lives in a man's world. You know that about that, and I can imagine what the men thought of her. She lived in minories, uh, and uh, and she taught. She taught. She was a very practical woman. Her books were very complicated. Um, she had, you know, they. She wrote articles and and for the uh, for, for, for the nautical magazine, and they referred to her basically saying uh, fighting. You know, you know, basically one of the fairest sex should not get involved in these sort of discussions. The fairest sex. And she took great umbrage for that and wrote a 2,000 word response to the magazine. And they wrote another one back and then she wrote another one back again. And she was, uh, she was a reader to Queen Victoria and, uh, she, um, she had royal patronage. She, uh, uh, she dedicated her books to Queen Adelaide. Uh, she was a friend of, uh, of, of uh, Captain Beaufort, of the Beaufort Windscale. And also the, the astronomer Royal Airy, George, George Airy. So they all highly respected her. But it was just a pity that no one had ever heard of her. And when she died, uh, strangely enough, uh, one of her relatives said, oh, look, could, you know, would they like to do something for her? And they basically said, oh, no, she's just a woman. Why would we do anything for her? So, But the Athenian magazine, rather <laughs> strangely, wrote, wrote, said that, you know, okay, they're not doing anything for her now, but maybe one day in years to come, um, one of her descendants will write something about it. Well, 200 years later, there we are. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So anyway, she's, she's, oh. probably, she's probably my favourite for obvious reasons. But anyway, yeah. just another remarkable woman out of all the remarkable women in, in the in the book. I could have I could have written another book with you know, uh, as well as a hundred women I've got there, with you know just as many. But I picked out the ones I thought were the most interesting and the most remarkable. Um, all the ones we've talked about tonight have, have since passed away, but a lot of people, of course, computers being, you know, changing all the time and the field of computing being so modern, many of them are, are still alive and some of them, as I said, are, are quite young, still still everything ahead of them in their field. Yeah, we were before we started recording this, how I'm by a fluke of me, I've managed to pick everyone is dead. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. You killed them. You killed the last one a few weeks ago. <laughs> Uh, this is just another thing that I'm cursed for. But, uh, I think you but this is uh, really, really interesting. Yep, thank you. I, I was going to say, you shouldn't mention any, any more names of women who are alive. No, it's, it's just another... Uh, people say that I'm cursed when it comes to meeting women, and now I'm killing them off as well, so it's probably best <laughs> i just become an old choice myself. <laughs> I love your idea. But that, it's, been, you know, it's been really interesting. Would, would, you, would you mind reminding everyone the title of your book? When that and when where they can get it, and also if you want to um re- replug the, the one about uh, Janet Taylor. Again. Okay, yeah, uh, this book is called IT Girls: uh, Pioneer Women in Computing, uh, and you can get it at all good bookstores, and I'm sure you can get it on Amazon and online if you if you wanted to do that. Uh, if you really if you have a daughter or you know somebody that might be interested in computing, they find it fascinating the stories of the of these women, particularly in the world of IT. But if you're interested uh, in science in general and, and the role that women have played in science over hundreds of years and continue to, to, to do so, uh, my previous book called uh, called Women of Science, uh, also published by Amberley a couple of years ago, uh, has women from many different fields, 100, 100 women, uh, and they also led fascinating lives and, and their contributions were just amazing. Absolutely, and uh, we'll try and get we'll get them on the uh, History Hack online bookstore as well. So that way, with every sale, the podcast takes a slight, a tiny slice of money, and you, as the author, get more money than if it was to go through a popular rainforest named website that I'm not allowed to name. Otherwise, I get sued, and I don't have any money as it is. <laughs> uh, no, I I see my my work sometimes on websites where other people are charging access to it, <laughs> and I can't get it myself. <laughs> Uh, well, well, you don't get rich. You don't get rich writing books, do you? Our incredible guests give us forty-five minutes of their time to join us and talk about their work or their new book. This is just a small taster. As a result, we have launched our very own bookshop on bookshop.org, where you can find our guests' latest books. You can support them, and you can support us on History Hack. Ten percent of every sale via our bookshop supports the podcast and allows us to keep going and bring you more top-of-the-line guests. You can find our bookshop at bookshop.org forward slash shop forward slash history hack or search for us in the shop section. 
Thank you so much for your continued support. We really appreciate our listeners and supporters. So make sure you get down to the bookshop and grab yourselves a new book.